Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff, and this show is all about philanthropic leaders and the work they do. Today, we have with us a very, very interesting woman. Her name is Gloria Rubin. She's an actress, advocate, a woman involved in philanthropy, and an author and an all-round wonderful woman. Gloria, welcome, and it's so great to have you on this show. And Thanks, Gloria, you've been in the public eye for a long time now. You've had so many different roles on television and then in movies, and we most of us know you for your ro role in ER. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did and and who you were. Mm -hmm. Well, it was very different back then because I say back then because it was a long time ago. You know, it was that, in the 90s, right? Yeah, I and know, then... which was like 80 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that. No, but um, yeah, the first show, it, it started airing in 1995. And uh, Jeannie Boulet, who was the uh, character I portrayed, um, you know, came on about halfway through the first season. I was signed to do maybe three episodes and the three turned into six. And then... Uh, Jeannie was a regular character starting the second season. It was a terrific role because towards the end of the second season, you know, it was discovered that Jeannie became um, HIV positive. She contracted the virus from her husband. And especially in the mid-90s, you know, it was a very rare thing. Still to this day, as far as I know, as far as, you know, the, as we're recording mm -hmm. this, um, I understand that there has not been another HIV positive leading uh, regular role on any network television program. I know there's not just network anymore, but one that did not die from AIDS. You know, Jeannie uh, lived with um, the virus. And, you know, at that time, it was a very, still very much of a taboo subject, if you will. And and the, and the it was a very brave thing for us to do that storyline on the show. And um, especially because, you know, I, I, you know, we made an agreement that Jeannie would not die from AIDS because at that time medicines were being created and formed and uh, paired so that people were literally getting their lives back. And so you helped things, audiences by playing this role. Yeah. And, and what was it like? Did you actually go out and do a lot of research? And you must have in order to play that role effectively and then to be a value to audiences, which you were, of course. Uh, thank you for that. Yes. Um, it was a very, uh, you know, well, how do I say? I definitely did a lot of research and there was a situation in my life where the research was very close. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm writing about the experience as a whole in, um, in my next book, a full autobiography. So I'll get into it in detail there. Nonetheless, um, we really did. Jeannie was a hope, even to this day, you know, because the full, all of the seasons of ER apparently have been re-aired on, on um, you know, on one of the streaming services. So now there are, there's a whole new generation. Um, I literally just got an instant message uh, or a, a personal message, direct message on Instagram today about someone who had just, who was watching the show for the first time with her daughter and she was bringing up Jeannie's storyline. So we made a really uh, long standing, important impact portraying this woman who, you know, at that time, she, you know, she was married, professional, heterosexual. This was a demographic that nobody was, nobody thought would be able to contract the virus. So I'm very proud of that role because, again, it's forever. And I didn't want, I knew that I knew this story, the message that I wanted to be in the world forever. And we did that. And that's wonderful. And I think you won a few awards. I, I won. Well, I was nominated <laughs> for a couple of um, Emmys and a Golden Globe. Congratulations yes, for you. the nominations. Cast, got a few awards. So, yes, thank you. Uh, it was a very exciting time. Um, do you know, then cut to quite a few years later when I, I portrayed Elizabeth Keckley with uh, alongside Daniel Day-Lewis and Sally Field in Steven Spielberg's Lincoln. Right. Elizabeth Keckley was uh, born into slavery, but she bought her own slavery, became, um, she was a dressmaker, opened up her own dressmaking shop in Washington, D.C., and was hired by Mary Todd Lincoln to be her personal modiste. So that's an old story, uh, her old, her, a whole story unto itself. I'll be telling that whole story at some point. And, and soon. speaking <laughs> about uh, slavery and the horrific um, 
history of of our country as yeah. it relates to slavery. Yes. And now the dawn of a new era where we're everyone's involved in yes. promoting racial justice. Yes. Are you involved in the movement at all? Or what are you doing? Because I know for me, as um, a woman, um, it's very important to me just to try to help be uh, someone who can support yes. racial justice yes. and and help it move forward because it's it's been long in the cards uh, and it's about time. It's about time for racial justice, for economic justice, for gender justice, like for we have many, many, right? But the first and foremost thing, this particular time in the summer and fall of 2020, um, in the midst like the pandemic wasn't enough, but everything happens in its own time and it's time now. Absolutely. It's beyond time. So there is an extraordinary opportunity here for um, people in their communities, in our, their homes, in their places of worship, in their communities, in their, in their government, local, state, federal, to really step up to the plate here and make some fundamental changes. And as my belief is, is that it always starts, at, everything starts at home, right? So how are we talking amongst each other and with children and our, uh, you know, family, papa, about what's happening in the world and how we can make it better? And, and how is one going to participate in the process. That is key. Now, I'm from Canada originally. I'm a dual citizen. I made sure that I became a U.S. citizen so that I could vote. I'm of mixed race, right? I'm black and white. So this is like a lot of layers for me in this particular subject, right? As a, as a, America is my home. So, you know, I'm a Canadian American again, but this is my home. So I am invested in making this place and as participating good as, it can be. as good as it can be. And so the, it, starting at home, meaning, you know, it has to begin with me personally as well. Where have I in my own life or in my own thoughts even, when and where have I been biased or when and where have I been racist in my, what I'm thinking? I may not act out on it, thank God, but, you know, like that's where it starts. For those who are acting out on it, then you know, clearly the outside world needs to step in and and help, you know, right that wrong. Well, one of the reasons why I love living in New York and its surroundings is because we live in a city of diversity. And then when you're, say, on Long Island in the Hamptons, it's a, it's a place of diversity. And I think it's so important to embrace diversity in every in in every way possible, and and also you're right about what we do at home. It's so important to teach children right from the yeah first day of birth. I mean, <laughs> children can't speak, but from the crib, how important it is to value life and to to look at someone not because of their race, not because of their gender, not because cause of their religion, but to look at each individual as equal and as one and as the same and not to look and to find differences. And, it's and all, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's, that's, that's you know, literally <laughs> as we all know who said this, because to look the content of their character. That's everything. How is someone, who are they in the world? What are they doing? What is reflecting who they are on the inside? That's what behavior is to me. I'm no saint. Don't get me wrong. I'm completely flawed in <laughs> so many well, no, ways. But No one's perfect. Yes, I'm certainly indeed. not perfect. Find me a perfect person and you'll find me someone who's not telling the truth. Right. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. So there, that's, you know, that's a wonderful thing, again, about this time, as complicated and challenging, and sometimes terrifying as it can be, is that it's, it's, it's combing through all the muck. It's like we're seeing it for what it really is, and there's no hiding anymore. Well, I think so, we're moving forward. Yes. Exactly. And I think that's key. And, yeah. and speaking about moving forward, um, we're in the middle of this pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And as our viewers know, this has been a real challenge to almost every single American. At one point, we had 38 people, 38 million people in the United States out of work. We saw enormous numbers on food pantry lines. We saw so many, so many hardships, and we continue to see those hardships. So 
Now, as we may go into a second or third round of this terrible pandemic, we have to all come together and support one another and do everything we can to be useful to society. Mm -hmm. And I understand you're involved on a few different charity boards. And, and are any involved with the COVID-19 mm -hmm. relief programs that we're seeing all around the country? I think you're involved with Kerry Kennedy's Robert F. Kennedy yes. um, Humanitarian Awards, and yes. then you're involved in a charity to help people psychologically, correct? Right. Yes, exactly. So can you tell me a little bit about them and then what they're doing for the pandemic? Right. Well, um, you know, our RFK Center for Justice um, and Human Rights, I'm on the advisory board. And, you know, that's been obviously Kerry has, not obviously, but Kerry has picked up the baton of her late father and yes. for decades now. And I've been a supporter and for a long time. Exactly. So you know the work that is done globally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in terms of, of, of how specifically she's helping during this pandemic or how far the organization is going, you know, obviously with, with fundraisers or being on the ground, you know, Carrie would travel extensively and I've gone on a couple of trips with her um, to to see what's happening on the ground with in terms of human rights and human rights violations and supporting mm -hmm. the local mm -hmm. human rights advocates and, and, and uh, activists. Obviously, all of that can't happen now. So it's been, um, you know, really difficult, needless to say, to, to there's nothing like being, seeing somebody in person. Obviously, they're doing what they can virtually. And, you know, fundraising is, is key as it is for an, uh, um, every uh, nonprofit. But um, And in 2020, she's honoring Fauci, Dr. Fauci, yes, correct? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I know, for real. If I could, I'd have him over for dinner. But I can't do that. I can't feed I him think because we I all masks would. on. <laughs> I know. He's been well, a real he, hero he to so many people. 100%. Talk about human rights activists. Yeah. He yeah. is the one guy that's totally in today's time for sure. Yes, and I hope that remains. Yes, indeed. And so but, then the other charity yes. that you're very involved with. Vibrant Emotional Health. I just recently became involved with them because my paths crossed, my path crossed with the, the CEO, President and CEO, Kim Williams. We were um, involved with a separate organization um, for um, our, uh, servicemen and women battling uh, mental health. Post-traumatic stress disorder Indeed, and depression, other. anxiety, exactly mm -hmm. everything that um, is connected to, uh, you know, being in war. So, um, so our paths crossed, and when Kim was the new uh, president of Vibrant Emotional Health, and um, they do extraordinary work. They run; they're a national organization. They used to be just for New York. Um, but now it's, you know, they, they are, they, it's like the umbrella for National Suicide Prevention Hotline and all these different, you know, texting, calling, email, whatever kind of outreach um, people need. In today's times, you know, I mean, it's no secret or mystery that uh, I think that anyone, not anyone, but a lot of people are struggling with mental health, mental health issues. Because well, especially of the, now with the pandemic and everything else, exactly. of course, and... It's very so important. It's and extremely important. And, you know, we've seen the numbers of cases um, uh, in terms of anxiety and depression go through the reef, roof. Needless to say, certain demographics more than others, young people are really feeling it. You know, they're high, very high numbers with um, young people who, uh, you know, are um, having um, very difficult mental health issues and, and uh, you know, thinking about suicide, et cetera. Well, a lot of young people now have lost jobs and their careers right. that were on a very successful path, That's those right. careers have come to a halt, yes. a screeching halt That's as, exactly a right. as a result of the yeah. pandemic. So Mine I understand. Well. You know, I mean, I not, you know, I live solo, right, at this current day. And um, to not have any contact. You know, for the, I mean, I have recently because you can meet people outside, etc. But um, for those first couple of months, and you know, it was awful. I, there was no one I could talk to in person. Like there was no one. I couldn't get a. Hug, I couldn't give or receive a hug. I'm a creative person. I'm creative in front of the camera with other people in the room. I mean, thank God I'm going. You know, work is filming is resuming soon. But seven, eight months of nothing like that. It has been. I'm also creatively, musically, in writing. Those things are, are you know, 
Writing is a very solo, very uh, solitary thing to do. I wasn't doing anything. For the first three or four months, I couldn't even t I couldn't even write a word. I well, barely even sat at the piano. I was so depressed. I was like, mm -hmm. when is this going to end? I mean, it changed my life dramatically as well. But I'm hopeful. Yes. And I think we all need to be hopeful right now and always. But it's been it's been a tough haul for most of us. And we will get through this, yeah. though. And... I know I'm using now my Instagram platform yes. to to try to be positive to other people because yes. th this is not a well, good time. It, this is a, it, a terrible time. Exactly. But, so now let's talk a little bit about you as an author. You wrote a beautiful book about your family, and it's it was a very heartfelt book, and you lost two brothers which is a terrible thing. I know you're one of six children. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the book, the name, Yeah. everything about it? I happen to love the book, but I want, you. in your words, to talk about your book. Thank you. Uh, it's called My Brother's Keeper. Right. Yeah. With the apostrophe at the end of the S. <laughs> My brother's keeper, My brother's and it's keeper. mostly about your relationship with your younger brother who died when he was in his 20s, correct? Yes, both my brothers. Well, it starts with my first brother, David, who died by his own hand. He died by suicide mm -hmm. just before his 22nd birthday. I'm very, very sorry. So, thank you. Um, so, it's it, you know, the first section is... is honoring him and really diving deep into, mm -hmm. you know, the, how do you say, kind of the kernels, the things that, that were planted early on within the familial home that uh, were not necessarily conducive to building a strong inner life. Or, or self-esteem. Self mm -hmm. Or, you know, mm, trust. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. And then the second section is in honor of my brother Dennis, who passed away just 10 years ago, which is, you know, so 10 years is like a long, it's like, you know, it's quite a length of time, but it's just, oh no, wait, it's like two weeks ago. Sometimes it feels like that, right? So um, it took me, you know, a, quite a while to put the book together and it happened organically just from, a, I, I write, I'm a big journal writer and I started kind of writing and shaping some of former entries, past entries into these essays. And then I started kind of tying them together with familial stories. And then there's this book, My Brother's Keeper. And it's, it's you know, it's a small, it's a mighty book. It's small, but it's mighty. It's very, um, yeah, I'm really proud of it. I really, uh, it was very difficult because I I really, you know, I, I have been a very private person for almost all of my life, but I definitely, there was something in me that um, had to just, you know, open up. You had to write the book, yeah, something, and, the book. and people can f learn from this book. Yeah. I know I, I was so touched by it, and I just said, this is such a beautiful story, and I'm so happy that Gloria Rubin is sharing this with the world. And now for those watching the show, how can they purchase the book? Well, is it can, on Amazon? Yes, but <laughs> no, let's not go to Amazon. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you can do what you want, but I would prefer, it would be lovely if people just went to um, GloriaRubinShop.com because then I'll sign a book personally and ship it to them. How nice. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Amazon won't do that. They'll ship it to you, but it won't be signed personally by me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is really wonderful that you're signing the book yeah. and and allowing people not only to have the book, but to have a little bit of you by it, having your autograph on it. Exactly. <laughs> Which is really beautiful. And now you're in the middle of writing a second book or you're planning the second book. Yes. No, I'm in the midst of the second book. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Or? Well, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't want you to uh, sp spill the beans. Spill no, the beans. Don't worry. That's right. But whatever you want to tell us, we'd be happy to hear. Well, it's actually, it's the kind of the, so my brother is keeper. I, like I mentioned, I, I, I went deep. But this is an even deeper excavation because it's the full autobiography. 
So I'll talk about not just, you know, my life in Canada, but going, moving to Hollywood, what it was like being in Hollywood. I'm still, of course, a part of the entertainment business, but I don't live in Los Angeles anymore. So what was that like moving there? I knew just one person. A lot of fun, I would imagine. It was... <laughs> Every time I go to L.A., I love it. I'm I sure love you, being in that I know. world. <laughs> Not so much fun for me. It was very difficult. No, it wasn't. It was fun. It was everything, though. You know, moving from Canada to the U.S., these are two very different countries <laughs> yes. in many, many ways. And frankly, when I moved to Los Angeles, I, you know, again, being mixed. Look, there's racism everywhere. But it wasn't until I moved to the United States when it became very, very clear about the line between black and white. Like, it was like a slap in the face. When I, it was shocking, frankly. Well, I'm sorry so, to hear oh, that. Oh, no, no, it's okay. It just was, it just opened my eyes in a different way. And in, and that's good. That's okay. I don't, it's good to, to learn different things and to have my perspective being broadened. Um, it's It was very delicate and continues to be a very delicate thing in Hollywood these days for, for, for people of color of any color. Right. That tide is t turning as well, as we all know. Yes. About time. Correct. Uh, exactly. About time. <laughs> because so there's been a lot of talk about that yeah. in the last few years, especially about how there weren't enough black actresses and actors getting awards or movies produced right. by Indeed. them. Or Latin. Like, that's right. Lat right. You, you but know, that, I'm not saying the right, but, you know, or Asians. People or of color. Indigenous people of people, color. People of color. Yes. And I think the whole world is changing. And yes, it is. How was it growing up as a biracial young girl in yeah. Canada? Yeah. Was, your mom was white, your dad was? No, my, my father was Caucasian. My mother is uh, mulatto. So, you know, as I mentioned right. in my brother's keeper, my father was, um, uh, he passed away older. when I was young. Much older than my mother. So there's, a, you know, there was that element, like 35 years older than my mother. So there's that element on its own in this time, right? Like in the 60s and 70s, this is not happening so mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. in the suburb of Toronto or in London, Ontario. Very um, conservative place, London, Ontario, especially. I understand, yes. Is, so it was, <laughs> it was, um, let's just say I, I uh, it was, yeah, it was not, it was extraordinarily difficult. Sorry to hear, it, and... And what advice would you give to a young person mm -hmm. who will grow up in the same situation mm -hmm. as you grew up? What advice would you give That's to them a good now? Question. I think, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's it so much of it depends on the foundation in the home. It starts at home, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It really very much depends on the inner strength and self-esteem and trust of the parents or the guardian or whomever is raising these children. First and, and, then, foremost. If, and if you don't have that, then then I, I, the advice that I would give, okay, the, there's, here's the thing. Today, thank God, as things have evolved, continue to evolve and change and grow, is that help is available now. There's, there is more acceptance for any kind of mix of any, because, you know, really when it comes down to it, we all got a little bit of something in there. I Absolutely. <laughs> but in, in but, my family, there was always acceptance. And, and it was so important that we treat everybody the same and we'd be punished if we didn't. So it came from your so parents. So my parents, That's exactly. And exactly. and so getting back now to your acting career, because yeah. I think a lot of our viewers um, remember you and think of you in great roles. What are you doing right now? I know you said you had to stop for a little while, but yes. is there anything new on the horizon? Yes. I know yeah. you have a great book. You yes. have great charities you're involved yeah. with. What about the acting? Yes, thank God. Thank you, Divine. So, City on a Hill, which was, um, which is a Showtime series, we got picked up starring Kevin Bacon. We got picked up for a second season, and that's what we began filming at the beginning of this year. Of course, stopped in February, March. So, we are picking that up to finish um, the seven episodes that we didn't complete. So, that has resumed filming. That's that's the. Um, you know, newest thing that is happening right now. And that's exciting. It is exciting. I know. And you know <laughs> Something what's, to look forward I'm to. I'm so and looking forward to it. I think we're all looking forward to 
moving forward with yeah. careers and yeah. having a regular life. But I'm so glad it's actually coming to fruition for you. So it's great. It's I'm very, very great. <laughs> and you never know what other doors will open. Exactly. I look at you. You're beautiful. You're oh, thank you. well spoken. You're thank just you. a wonderful human being. Well, I'll take that. And I'm. Before this interview, I was so happy to be able to get to know you a little, and I hope we continue with a yes, friendship. Definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely. And I, I look at someone like you, and you are able to do so much for people, young people, older people, everyone. And I hope that you'll continue to use your platform yes. to do good. And I know you will. I have a yes. feeling you will. Very, very special woman. And thank you. Uh, we have about 20 seconds left. <laughs> what would you like to leave the audience with? I'd like to leave the audience with this. You asked earlier about what uh, advice for young people. Always be creative, whatever that means. Create, 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 and express that. And believe in yourself. Exactly. <laughs> and that will come from expressing your inside, from your ex being creative, expressing yes. it, putting it out there. Well, that's beautiful. Well, thank you all for tuning in this week to Successful Philanthropy. With us today was Gloria Rubin, an extraordinary woman. She's an actress, advocate, philanthropist, an all-round wonderful person, and she's an author too. I'll see you next week, and thank you again.